Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Leadership Now with me, Dan Pontifract. Today in the house all the way from Wellington, New Zealand, creative producer DK. Yes, DK, that's official legal name. DK works with a wide range of clients, crafting delicious learning experiences either online, in studio, or in-person events. He is the nine-year ex-TEDx Wellington and TEDx Wellington Women licensee plus founder of the unique video podcast, Creative Welly, of course, and the annual Creative Leadership NZ New Zealand Conference. He's also a speaker coach, working with CEOs and senior executives, plus a random ex all black and a dame throw into the mix. DK delivers internal masterclasses on the topics of purposeful storytelling to small leadership groups. Previously, DK established Collider, a citywide program focusing on transforming Wellington into an internationally recognized smart capital with over 200 events in a 14-month period with well over 5,000 attendees. He's also founded Media Snackers in 2006 and through it has over a decade of working in the social media space, consulting and delivering training on five continents to a cross-sector range of clients from UNICEF, the Gates Foundation, BBC, Ubisoft, Hasbro, plus he spent time as a social media manager for a national education company in New Zealand. All the way from over there, I'm in Canada. DK, welcome to the show. We're going to talk a bit today about speaking, events, Mm -hmm. online, face-to-face. You seem to have just a repertoire of experience. So let's start out with an easy one. Okay. Given your experience, DK, what is the attributes or what are the attributes that actually make up a good face-to-face speaker? We'll start there and then we're going to turn things into the online side. What a great question to start. And thank you for the invitation to participate in this, uh, Dan. Really appreciate your time. Um, So what are the elements that make up a great in-person speaker? Well, it depends on the situation and the person speaking and the topics. All right. So of course, how long is a piece of string question? But if I was to con condense it down, I suppose. Uh, I usually, when I work with clients, whether it be one-to-ones or in my internal masterclass, I focus on three things, like three elements, that if you put all those things, like a good Venn diagram, if they overlap very well, then you've got a great presentation in whatever context that we're talking about here. And those three things are really simply credibility. This is the stories that come out of your mouth, all right? The stories that you tell, the models, the frameworks in which you tell them as well. Grace is the second one, which is not what you're saying, it's how you are saying it. So that is your intonation, your stress points, your pauses, but also your physicality up there as well with some of the designs of the presentations also as well thrown into the mix. And the third one is the resonance piece, which is everything the audience is experiencing as an emotional journey based on how you were saying what you're saying and what you're saying. So if you put those three elements together, um, you, you get a great presenter and some people as you can imagine need work on some of them not all of them like mm-hmm. one aspect you uh, a lot of ceos or senior leaders are very confident in public speaking but they're not great storytellers and if you think again like a venn diagram you probably know very confident public speakers but brevity is not their their, their strong point so you think okay Brevity in terms of a storytelling skill is what we need to work on here versus the the nervous and, and that horrible feeling of you need to throw up, need to go to the loo side of I just don't want to public speak ever again in my life side of things which most people also uh, have. So it's a lot of those confluence of those issues that make a great public speaker. Love it. Okay, so your Venn diagram, credibility, grace and resonance, uh, which yeah. resonates with me. If we shift it to the online environment, we will come back to face to face and some other topics and, mm-hmm. and questions I have for you about speaking itself. But when do those translate those that Venn diagram, those three uh, pillars to the online speaker space as well? Yes, they do. However, now there's a different medium you have to consider and a different, I suppose, resonance piece. So that if you remember resonance was the third, which was the audience experience of you speaking. Mm-hmm. Now, what this is what most people do online when they speak, right? When they be introduced in a webinar series or say they're speaking to a conference or, or, or just online in any environment, what they usually do is start with, um, can everybody hear me? 
Uh, that, yeah, okay. Uh, hold on, I'm just going to share my screen. And then they disappear behind a slide, yeah. like this, for example. Yeah. And, and yeah. you won't see them again. And what you hear in them is reading from a script that they have prepared. And their intonation goes like this because they are reading. And you lose the human aspect, which is me in, mm. in the piece. So when I'm coaching speakers to speak online now, I'm very much coming through an audience experience and medium lens. In other words, with 2D environment now, we're reduced in terms of size to a post-it size stamp. If you are sharing your screen, you're reduced even further and you're hovering in a corner somewhere or you're completely gone from the experience of the audience now. So the cognitive fatigue that we've, uh, sorry, the Zoom fatigue that we've all read about and aware of, if you actually read the data coming out of Stanford, it's not just about the amount of time spending online. It's about the cognitive load that you have, have on you when you're now experiencing something that needs your attention, however, is reduced vastly in terms of what you're, uh, what you're used to. So we as humans like other humans, another experience. We're kinesthetic. We like to, you know, feel things and stuff like that. Now we're just sat at home, sat down for a while. Now we're on a 3D, 2D environment. Someone is trying to tell us stuff and they're not even there. And you can hear them reading and they're boring slides and they're not even on the screen. So you can't see their emotion in their face to mirror it back from them. So a lot of my time is trying to get leaders to stop sharing their screen, but understand that you can do some funky stuff. Like I just shared a slide like this or another slide like this or another slide like this. And I'm doing this to just my fingers down here using something called a stream deck, which is an Elgato program. And I get a sort of software broad system where can literally set my press jump between there. And they can be like, gifts like this or videos uh, or do this so I can stay on the screen and have have the presentation on the other side you can see really creative potential in presenting online rather than the reductive experience that most people have which is sharing screens reading a script and I can read faster than you can speak by the way so if I'm hearing someone reading something I'm like give it to me I can read faster and I can get that information faster than me. I want to see you. I want to see you emote what I should be paying attention to. So that's the difference between in-person and online. Hopefully that makes sense. It makes sense because we can go straight to a bookshelf behind us, right? I mean, let's let's do it. Why not? Let's Now, the first one, the first pillar, credibility, you alluded to the point of storytelling. And you seem to be a master mm -hmm. at storytelling and helping executives and others with their own storytelling. So what are the, I guess, the tenants, be it online or in person, that you recommend that we should be, you know, thinking about as a speaker in that credibility first factor and the the ultimate art, obviously, right, DK, of telling a story? So what a great question. Thank you for that. I did wince at the master bit. So thank you. I'm, I'm a master learner, I think. So I'm still learning this stuff. But the idea of story models and, and frameworks uh, can... I, I always fall back into the environment in which the presenter is presenting in and the reason why. I'll give you a couple of scenarios. If people stand on a stage in front of 800 people at a conference, that's very different than maybe pitching to your board the next five-year strategy in a nice quiet room with mm. attention right there and 12 people who you probably have deeper relationships with than mm. the 800 people you don't know because you just flown in right so there's a different environment and different reason to stand and it probably needs then different story models however there are some i suppose commonalities where all great stories have similar things for example humanization is the one i always lean into a lot uh so in other words Tell me great facts and figures to situate, you know, the, the topic in which you're sharing and, and excite me and ignite me or scare me, for example, uh, of what's going on in, in, in the topic, like I said. But throw a human into that mix, whether it be me as the user, whether it be you as an experienced person within it, that lived experience is much more credible talk about credibility than something you read and had nothing to do with now i'm not saying don't quote other people and don't quote other things that you've mm -hmm. seen but definitely throw if not you another person in the, in the mix like what does this matter to jane or joe at the end of this process or story because that humanization again we see ourselves in things much simpler uh, and, and we deepen that emotional connection and that credibility also needs a little bit of emotional tension in there like great stories have an emotional tension so if you think about 
um like a spectrum of emotion just a linear spectrum of emotion mm -hmm. on one end we've got all the negative experiences that we might have from hearing some that fear that disgust you know that like really horrible feeling someone's telling you a story maybe about climate change and putting all the figures up there you're down there actually right mm -hmm. versus right. the other end end of the spectrum is that elation that hope that one can give you through great stories, you know? Um, now, the worst place you can be on that linear spectrum of emotion when you're telling stories is in the middle, what I call the meh zone, which is M-E-H. You know, you just listen to someone and go, eh. You know, you have no emotional kind of attachment to it. But again, to, to get around that, if you throw a human in it, whether it be you're trying to situate the people in front of you in that process or the end users that you're trying to advocate for, in that process you move to one end of the spectrum mm. so those are the cute little tricks that i i throw in when i'm working with clients around story humanization and emotion and our lived experience gives it a lot more credibility so another one i had for you dk uh which you you touched on but almost um invisibly or subliminally and that is audience so mm. what is it that speakers need to be doing to prepare for what type of audience they're about to speak to. So a CEO mm -hmm. addressing a town hall of their own company is a little bit different mm -hmm. than a leader doing a public conference um, that's for management or leadership professionals where there's a thousand people in the room. So tell us a bit about how you um, advise speakers to prepare mm -hmm. for the audience in their remarks as they're building out the actual uh, presentation itself. Again, another delicious question for me to tackle here. And, and it comes to, I, I would answer that in terms of the literacy, understanding where the audience is at. Now, that could be quite hard. So if I'm going to deliver, I always ask a couple of standard questions uh, to the person who booked me, for example. It's like, well, who are the audience? What are the, the makeup of them in terms of like demographics, in terms of age, in terms of, I suppose, job titles and uh, arenas in which they play in? Um, and then also where they at in this subject as well. Am I starting here or do I have to bring or do I have to bring my kind of aim down a little bit or can I start a little bit higher? Right. Now, I always tend to start higher just because I want to pull people up to my level rather than come down to theirs. And that's not a an arrogant thing to think more than anything is that we want to challenge people to go oh i never thought about that rather than if you come down and spend a lot of time in that level of literacy you're probably expending a lot of energy to just to try and connect so as you know the ted format it, it works itself quite well into this other ted tedx format which i've got a lot of experience with is stand up say something provocative or ask a question that moves the audience and situates them in the topic in which you're going to now tackle but make it i suppose as engaging as an interesting as possible for them now as you know tedx audiences are quite interesting they're quite diverse mm -hmm. i always describe them as madly curious you wouldn't go to a tedx event if you're not curious about lots of different yeah. things right now that's very different than if you're going to an event on a specific vertical within an industry mm -hmm. so you'd start away you know that their levels of literacy might have much higher than just the general populace so again you would start in a different way so that's how i would approach thinking about audiences is try to bring them up to your level try to ignite that curiosity to get them to go my my metric for success after a great talk which answers this question quite neatly is uh i want people to come up and either ask more questions or challenge me about something i said right at the end so i want that little bit of the line coming up to speak to me at the end and that's my metric for success the performance itself probably and arguably is equal to the content or your positioning or the audience mm -hmm. and so what i love about your um, your triad, your Venn diagram, is you're placing some emphasis on delivery through intonation and through pause, mm. which a lot of speakers often forget and or are so excited that they just talk a mile a minute and they want to spew as much data and or stories as mm. they can. So what is it that we need to be um, reconciling, if you will, on the performance and the delivery of the talk itself when it comes to things like intonation and pausing? Ooh, one of my favorite things to work on with clients because most people who speak fast pick that 
up specifically rather than the pauses yeah we'll come back to that but people who will race a minute and speak fast because they're up there and very scared and they just want to get to the end that's the nervous but a lot of the issues uh come down to breathing so i can slow someone down in their breathing techniques versus slowing their speech pattern down Mm. breathing as you know is one of those brilliant skills to also chill you the hell out uh, you know the parasympathetic system is regulated by your breathing so if you can just take a moment and breathe deeply and get it back to what's called the resting breathing rate which most people don't know they have they know they have the resting heart right you actually have a resting breathing rate as a human so if you understand what your resting breathing rate is before you are speaking i guarantee if you check it if you put your hand on your diaphragm and just check your breaths in and out and you know what your breath resting breathing rate is i guarantee it won't be anywhere close it'll be shallow and it'll be quick but breathing is one of those things you can control so if you then force yourself to breathe slowly back to your resting breathing rate you reset your whole system default mode in your brain kind of kicks in a little bit and you go out there much more measured and calm and literally your speech will slow down as well just through your breathing alone so that's one little cute little trick that that people can can use uh and then again just find your resting breathing rate by counting how many times you you breathe in 30 seconds and that's your resting breathing rate boom and and figure that out uh the other ones are on pause and intonation now that's mm. where the craft comes in right that's so i always say that the craft of any uh the creative craft is always in the editing right anything that you do the craft is always in the editing so i feel like when you're pausing in it then you're almost editing your talk as you go and you're stressing things through that pause and intonation now intonations could be a stress point that you come in and and that's uh added to what round your your face you know you frown and you lean in and you make some gestural cues as well versus when you lean back and just go what do you think about that mm. you let that hang you know, and then but straight away, you have guided your audience into a reflection mode because you've asked that question, you created space for them rather than just carry on through all the way through. My other big thing about, about speech and, and creating space and, and helping people to be much more clear, clearer is something that most people miss, but are very aware of, by the way. We all know ums and ahs and you likes and you knows creep into our speech uh, day to day. These are something called, it's got a big word for it. It's called disfluencies or diffluencies, depending on who you speak. But it's spelled disfluencies. It's a big word for those small little words that we add and we fill into our speech patterns constantly, the ers and the ums. And a lot of people are blighted by that. There's a lot of, um, mm, okay, you know, mm, uh, stuff like that. And I, again, try to help you to think through that if, if I'm working with you by adding in, instead of a um and an ah, add in a pause. So first, uh, to get away, to try and tackle that is you've got to be aware of it. So record yourself, and then suddenly you re realize you're saying er a lot or um a lot. Now you're aware of it. Just check yourself. So just be aware and inquire in yourself when you're speaking, not to stop it, but just go, oh, I'm saying that again. I'm saying that again. And once you get a pattern of recognition, you can then flip the switch into your brain and go, instead of saying um and ah, I'm going to add in a pause. And that's what I've trained myself to do. I haven't said an um and an ah yet, but I used to do a lot of um and ahs. But I also, every now and again, pause. And every time I pause, think about I'm usually saying um and ah. So that's all I've done there. And, and again, helping people with that helps people with their credibility. It slows them down, cr creates space in their speech rather than fills it with ums and ahs. So all those things wrapped up together kind of helps you to become, a, I suppose, a better orator. I'm always thankful for a previous speaker coach of mine whom provided me three very basic words, which was pause, not flaws, referring to the flaws being those, uh, what I just did, the ahs in the middle of a sentence. So I, I try to always think pause, not flaws, and I, uh, you know, I, I fail egregiously. We all do. We do. DK. Before we get off the platform and off the stage and ask about events and how you produce those mm -hmm. and, and what they are for you, one of my final questions about the experience and the delivery is the difference between or what's the right ratio of personal stories versus external or other people's stories or other organizations? Mm -hmm. how, how does one reconcile for the audience or from themselves what it is that makes the right balance so that you're putting the audience in the shoes of the speaker but that it's not just autobiographical with respect to the speaker. Mm. 
Yeah, that's a, that's a juicy but tough question. Uh, again, I need more context. Mm. There's, I've seen people who've done a very linear A to B of their life, or A to Z, sorry, of their life up on stage, and I'm enthralled. I'm engrossed, mm. right? And I'm leaning in because it's, it's wonderfully delivered and it's a fantastic story that they're telling their life. So it's all about them. Versus I've done, I've, I've also seen brilliant people who don't say a, a lick about themselves, but man, am I in, in, engrossed because they've, they've detailed other things in the world and they've humanized it, but not through themselves, but through other people and stuff. So I would say there's not a quick answer to that. I, I would want a more, more context, but there is a balance, of course. If you're talking too much about oneself, and let's be honest, pale male and stale leaders do this very, very well. And they stand up and they, oh, the last time I was here, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, but how are you going to bring that back to the audience and make right. them relevant in this story and so that they can see themselves in it? And we all know great films ask questions deep within your spirit and your soul. And that's what leaves you with that kind of tingly feeling versus, oh, wasn't that a great story? But I have nothing to do with it. Right. Even, you know, fantastical stories like Avatar and other things, we see them ourselves in it. So therefore we can connect to it. So that was that's the trick I would add or sprinkle back into that question is that if you can understand your audience better and understand the reasons to make them feel, then the balance should come out of that. Makes sense. Excellent. Okay. Let's get off the platform, off the stage. And before we even get onto the stage, someone needs to be thinking about curating, creating, producing, mm -hmm. if you will, uh, a learning event of some sort. So you call them delicious learning experiences dk so from mm. clients that are large corporates to major government departments your experience is vast what are the key tenants if you will to creating your in your mind delicious learning experiences what do we have to have There's so many elements i want to kind of pick up on on that one question that's a great question what does it need to have I suppose it needs to have empathy for hmm. the audience, first of all, or the delegate. Let's call them the delegate rather yep. than audience now because we're in event space versus a, an oratory space now. So delegates is a nice catch-all phrase for the people attending an event. I love it. Cool. So I lean back into my TEDx Wellington days. TEDx Wellington, um, I did it for nearly 10 years. I hung up my cloak uh, in 2020. 21 and, and kind of high-fived it out but we became known as a little bit of a, a kind of a creative example to the TEDx community uh, Ted used to go around and run events for other TEDx organizers and use TEDx Wellington as an example of good practice now it's not being mean arrogant or anything it's just that we used to take a different approach to our design of the experiences as we know TEDx experiences get people on our stage for 18 minutes at the most and that's pretty much it in terms of what people know is TED experience, but we used to run two events. We used to curate and, and create two events when we run TEDx one. The first one was just that, who are the speakers on the stage? How do we curate the great ideas worth spreading or sharing? How do we help them to share it in compelling ways? How do we create a visual aesthetic that people are going to be attuned and 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 curated well, so there's got a lovely th flow through uh, for the, uh, the delegates. So that's the stage experience. What most people don't think about is the other experience for the delegate, which is the external stage experience, which is everything to do with all the emails that they get when they book their tickets, right through to what's called, and I'm using an old theater term here, darling, which is called crossing the threshold. Oh. In other words, when they arrive into the, the auditorium or the theater or the actual venue itself, there's something called crossing the threshold in theater terms, which is why theaters, most old school theaters anyway, have beautiful, beautiful uh, um, kind of entryways, right? Mm. Because what we want the audience to experience or the delegates to experience is when they go to a theater, they're crossing a the threshold from reality to fantasy. They're coming into a different space. And that's why it's always beautifully ornate and everything is beautiful and expansive. It's marble and it's got dimly lit lights and stuff like that. That's a theater trick that they play on us from, since they do. They work that stuff out, right? So again, think about events. How, are they, how is your delegate crossing the threshold from their usual life, which they're stressed, they've got to grab their coffee on the way, they answer answering emails on the bus or the, or the taxi on the way to the event, to the time they arrive. And that's everything from... We used to put red carpets out before the entrance to oh, yes. the TEDx Wellington experience. Simple stuff. When people entered, smiley faces to people going, 
great to have you here thank you for coming how's your morning doing already to leading them to the 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 experience of grabbing the lanyard right and mm -hmm. filling that out and figuring out what what could the lanyard be an experience unto itself so we used to have lanyards with the you know put your name and uh in one word describe you know your favorite thing that you've experienced or uh sum you up in a in a in a kind of color or something like that you know move people into action and creative action but what we're doing there was we're priming people to experience what they're going to go on and, and experience and i've used that priming as, as a really interesting way to then move between those stages and connective experiences outside if you think about in a stage experience you sat down you're not really connecting other than with the speaker on the stage or the MC, if you like. And now and again, the MC will do that thing. Oh, I'll chat to someone next to you about blah, blah, blah for five minutes. You know, OK, that's the most connective we're going to feel right. in a, in a theatre experience versus when we're going outside. And we all know the beautiful stuff that happens, you know, over over the, the lunch menu or on in, in the hallways experience of events. That's where the connective, deep emotional connection can can amplify from what they experience. But give people reasons to do that from and again try to through line it so one last uh, example of that in tedx wellington 2016 we had a speaker speaking about funerals designing the best funeral right quite provocative and cool from my perspective it's like oh that's interesting but also we need to manage the audience is emotional journey here yeah. so we could have just chucked that lady up on stage and then boom uh, go out and have, an, have a little chat about it, you know, with other people, blah, blah, blah. But no, we go in. We know that people are going to be triggered in the audience from this topic. Mm. We know that because we're good humans. So how are we going to create a transitional experience from that talk into something else? How can they diffuse themselves man, or extend and lean into that vulnerability? So what we did, we stuck the person speaking at the end of that session, speaker session. So we knew that people would from the delegates would be going out now into the breakout spaces mm -hmm. to grab their coffees as well. But we also had ready in that breakout space, the opposite of what they just experienced. In other words, what's the opposite of death? Well, life. It's life. Yeah. Or, yeah, so what we had was a, a, a huge area, not huge, but a, a nice area where you could go and play with kittens. Because <laughs> new life. Right? How can you go wrong <laughs> with kittens? <So> we, <laughs> there we go. So we tempered it as an experience. So we knew if someone was triggered, we'd go straight out and go, <gasps> kittens, right? And they could yeah. sit and feel that lovely warmth of, of a kitten and, and feeling cool about it. Uh, we we kind of partnered with a local charity, a uh, uh, Cattery. Cattery? Yeah, you know, the SPA um, place, and we had that, and and most people remember that as a transitional experience, both the talk as well as the experience after, and they could sit and hold new life, but also talk about what they just experienced. So that's what I mean about delicious learning experiences, just to try and think deeply about the emotional journey of the delegate in those two arenas. It really seems to come down to vibe, like you're creating a vibe. Mm so that it's not just about what's on stage although important because you know mm -hmm. eight terrible speakers doesn't create the best vibe but the overall atmosphere mm -hmm. is the vibe from crossing the threshold uh to going home yeah totally and even that the exit as well is an interesting one which most people don't design um but the arrival is the the key point i always think one of our experiences as well we had people arrive and the theme was a chance uh, the TEDx, another TEDx that I ran, she was chance. So we sold tickets as a lottery system. So straight away, you were in a lottery, a chance to buy a ticket. Yeah. And when people arrived, um, we also gave them little little bands around their arm as their ticket, but it was a different color. And we told them just to follow the balloons because the balloons took you into four different entrances to the theater. And now you're going by chance, you're going to end enter a different way and going to sit by chance next to someone you didn't come with because now you're split up so again you can think about igniting and deepening the theme within the experience itself so if you're running a, a learning experience what's the theme of that experience how can you literally prime the audience upon the arrival and keep that going as experiences throughout so that was another cool example but the vibe i like that <laughs> All right, last question, and then we'll find out more about where we can find out more about DK. Um, there goes another. Um, the question I have for you has centered around DK. 
your approach to building out your own talks. And one of the things that I've glommed on to you is your ability and almost vivaciousness to be extemporaneous. Yes, you have a structure, but you don't mm. believe in scripts. You don't believe in memorizing, mm. quote, the speech, which mm -hmm. I think I've uh, alluded to you in the green room. You had me at hello because that's my whole <laughs> shtick and, and gig. But tell us a bit about what you mean by the preparation that's required to be extemporaneous, because it sounds ironical. It does. And it sounds scary as well. Let's be honest, for people then who are asked to speak on any subject. And we know it also goes against a lot of the perceived wisdom out there, mm -hmm. which is to write down everything, learn it, practice, practice, practice. And I say, don't, don't, don't. Because public speaking or presenting is one of those weird things that you can't practice. You literally can't practice public speaking. You can only prepare for it and then experience it. And the example I always give is, sorry to do the sport analogy, but sports. If you think about just practicing with your mates on any kind of game out there on the planet, that's very different than going into a, a physical and competitive arena. And that's why we got language language around uh, give them some game time, get their game legs, you know, mm -hmm. that match fitness yeah, stuff. Yeah. Because it's very different than just a practice arena. Now, public speaking is one of those exposure skills. You're only just going to be exposed to that arena. Now, you can practice what you're going to say, but know that the environment radically shifts from at home in front of your your cat or your spouse, and they're going to go, that's wonderful, darling. You got it down. And then, boom. The following day, you're in front of those 20, 30, 200 people, and you're on stage, you've got lights, and you can hear yourself with the mic now coming back, booming back at you. You can't practice that. Mm -hmm. And because you've shifted out environmentally and, and physiologically and visually out of that environment in which you practiced, of course, then you're going to forget stuff and you're going to lose your way. And you're going to be all, oh, I don't know where to look because the lights are blinding me and stuff like that. So that's why I say scripts are probably the one reason, you know, most people are held back by. Um, and, and the other reason is that, yeah, I just fall into that trap of, I think that are only, there's, there's a certain amount of people in the world that can v remember and verbalize quite well with emotion bl blocks of text and they're called actors. They are trained people and they, again, expose people. They, they've, they've conditioned themselves into that environment. Our, us mere mortals can't really do that very well. So what's the trick then? Well, the simple trick is to tell stories you know, speak on subjects that you have deep interest in and legacy or pedigree in, or can at least hold a good story around, and then substitute that a little bit as well, or kind of complement that rather than substitute that with nice visuals if you are gonna use something. So I cheat constantly, I don't have scripts when I speak, but I do have some nice slides and I'm visually attuned anyway, I'm a visual learner. So when I see a visual of something, I can remember the story relating to that talk. I'll give you a very quick story to illustrate this. So I was working with a very um, established uh, sports person here in New Zealand, uh, played for the, the rugby team here, which are very well known. And he had left the, the, that arena now and he was uh, into another kind of mode of his life professionally. And now he's become an ambassador for an industry. So he was now standing in front of different types of audiences, speaking and advocating through his lived experience on this industry. Cool. So I met with him. He already had his script done. He already had his presentation made by the industry body. And I was there just to help him craft that a little bit better. So obviously I sat and I go, go for it, fella. And he did. He presented very well. And I was like, cool. Yeah, great story. Lovely little visuals because they've done it really nice. He's yeah. had an interesting life. So he got some lovely photos there. Great. But I was really concerned to how to approach this because He's a man mountain, you know, six foot eight of him. And I was like, really, I'm, I'm a short guy. So I was like straight away, oh God, he's he's huge. And how am I going to wrestle his script from him? You know, because he's going to be quite cheeky. So what I asked of him, I said, oh, can I borrow your script for a second? I just want to get a sense of it. I was written. Yeah, yeah, cool. And I said, oh, just whilst you're there and I got a script, tell me about the time you you first got your cap playing for Canterbury. And he and he told me the story just very quickly. It doesn't matter. And, I, and then I said, oh, what, what about the first time you won your first All Black cap? And he told me that. What about the first time you won the World Cup? And he <laughs> told me that story. 
Yeah. And I was like, why do you need this? <laughs> you have all these stories that you have lived and you've known, and you've got visual indications of when to tell that story in your presentation. So straight away, I can validate someone's understanding of shit. I don't need a script if I tell the right stories with the right order, with the right visuals, and I can tell it because I've lived it. And however it falls out of my mouth that day, it's going to be the right story at the right time. Just got to remember the point of the story, which you should know anyway, right? <laughs> so that's a shorthand story of how we can get even big monsters away from scripts. This is brilliant stuff. I really could chat with you for much longer. Maybe we'll have to have a second episode uh, down the line in 2023 or 2024. DK, thank you for such wisdom and insights and for what you do. Where can we find out more about what DK, DK I'm sorry, is up to in the world? Simply my website, which is spelled out just a D and a K, which is J-U-S-T-A-D-A-N-D-A-K dot com, just a D and a K dot com, because that's what I'm constantly saying with my name when I introduce people introduce me and they say, oh, DK, and they say, DK, I said, yes, just a D and a K. So I bought the dot com. I've been running on that for the last 15 years, bless me. So uh, that's probably the best way. And that clicks through to my LinkedIn and you can get my Twitter on there as well. So, and you can feel free to hit me up through there as a contact form. It comes straight to me. And I'm always interested in hearing people if they want to challenge me or give me some insights as well. I'm happy to learn or if I can help you in any way. Thank you. DK, that's fantastic. And by the way, sidebar, when I do, uh, practice anything in front of my cats she always says it's perfect dk so <laughs> word to the wise Stop thanks it. everyone for uh <laughs> listening to another episode of leadership now with me dan pontifrac today it was dk just a d and a k what an excellent episode really thank you for your insights on both the speaking and the events world uh look forward to the next one thanks dk thank you dan